we need a feminist Green New Deal because climate change is not just a, a technical or scientific problem, it's a social problem because it deepens inequalities. And one of the best tools that we have for addressing inequality is intersectional feminism. Because that's an analytical tool that lets us see the ways that some people, just by virtue of their identities, class or caste or indigeneity or gender, on the basis of these kinds of identities, some people are denied basic rights. And that denial of basic rights puts them at far greater danger from climate breakdown. We can see that really clearly in a place like East Africa, where there is this clear correlation between worsening droughts and higher rates of forced early marriage of girls. And that is because families who are poor and rural, pastoralist, indigenous, have very few options but to marry off their daughters in exchange for a dowry once the drought has destroyed their economy. But we need that, that intersectional lens to be able to see these connections between the climate crisis and human rights violations like poverty and like forced early marriage. And once we make those links, then we can craft feminist Green New Deal policies that do what indigenous women in Kenya are already doing, which is to adapt local economies in ways that uphold human rights. The aim isn't just to ensure that people can survive the drought without forcing younger and younger girls to get married. It's to transform communities for the better. And we need those kinds of feminist solutions at the center of any Green New Deal because that's how we achieve what the Green New Deal promises, which is a way to turn the, the crisis of climate change into an opportunity for social change. There's really no such thing as domestic climate policy. You know, this is one planet with one climate system, and so we need to understand environmental policy as foreign policy. So right now, you know, the prospect for a binding Green New Deal, either from the United Nations or from some of the right-wing national governments that we're seeing in the world, are really, really slim. And what that means is that it's, it's up to us, it's up to social movements to try to win Green New Deal policies at whatever level of governance we can influence. But even at the most local level, we need to be thinking globally. So for example, if we are calling for an increase in renewable energy technologies in New York City, we need to think about what that is going to mean in places in Bolivia, where the minerals that are needed for renewable technologies are being mined. If we're going to increase the demand for mining, we need to avoid the kind of outcomes that we see today in mining communities, right? Environmental degradation and the displacement of local people, sexual violence and killing of women land defenders in these places. We have to be asking in a Green New Deal how we ensure justice and protection for people and for places at every step of the supply chain for renewable technologies, and that supply chain is global. In fact, a Green New Deal isn't just an opportunity to do less harm, it's actually an opportunity to correct for historic injustices. So, you know, welcoming climate refugees in your country or in your city should be part of any Green New Deal, because these are people who are being impacted today by a long history of carbon pollution. A global Green New Deal accounts for the full web of the impacts that policy choices create around the world. Green New Deal policy in the U.S. must reframe its relationship recognizing the rights of nature, what I call the territorial integrity of Mother Earth. This is systems change. We are not talking about reform. Our indigenous environmental network and our movement, we're talking about a just recovery, a framework that resists status quo solutions of disaster recovery, focuses on aid, extraction, and displacement, and moves forward. That's what we're talking about, moving forward towards a transformative solution that responds, that recovers, and rebuilds. His campaign currently supports hydraulic fracturing, or better known as fracking, geoengineering, such as carbon capture and storage, 
that are what I call fault solutions. Biden camp has not made sufficient commitments regarding either the Green New Deal or the climate crisis. Within our indigenous network and standing with people of color alliances that we formed, such as It Takes Roots, uh, we've been very strategic of building a support base within the Democratic Party. Uh, for an example, our friend, our sister, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who was one of the first to really pull out uh, the resolution on Green New Deal. Unfortunately, at that time, there wasn't much uh, action around Green New Deal. Uh, following that, I think it really got political, but there's a lot of uh, uh, inside uh, negotiation that uh, we hear of and we support. Uh, we feel that as we continue to meet with this uh, emerging coalition of friends with, within the, the House, that's going to be our base to put that pressure on Biden if he gets into office. There would have to be a radical shift of geopolitical power that are in favor of states who generally are concerned about their people and willing to make the economy serve the people instead of the elites. So it's essential that uh, on the international arena that uh, needs to be a, an embracing of the recognition of the rights of indigenous people.